meet everybody here. This is fantastic. So, uh, so very, very uh, thanks for coming on such a wonderful day and a special occasion for us here in mechanical engineering and the college of engineering. Um, let me start off real quick. We have two sign-up sheets. So some of you are in engineering 210 statics. Uh, we have one sheet for you guys, and we have, have that going around. But we also want everybody, including the static students, to sign up on our other sign-in sheet as well. So I'm going to start those around. So everybody signs the second one. And there's a pin there. I'm going to start that here. You guys are, please sign that as well. Um, what's that? Steve does. Oh, Steve? Well, Otherwise, we can't play for the cookies. <laughs> 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 That's a good idea, yeah. It's the, all the cookies you can eat, baby. Okay, um, all right, so thanks for coming again. So I appreciate uh, this opportunity to be able to introduce uh, a, uh, a, a very special person for our, to our college and to our department. Uh, Dr. Steve Tennyson has been here since 1995 and influenced a lot of people uh, in, that, in that time period since for 20 years. Was that 22 years? 21 years? Two years, five years. I can do that. Um, <laughs> so we uh, over the over that period of time, like I said, he's been here prior to the college even being a, in existence um, as Boise State. So there's been a lot of opportunities for him to impact people's lives. And one of the things that I that I did, and, and I'm going to share some of these stories with with him later, but I have. Asked some of the former students that have been through the program to send some stories about Steve Tennyson. So I want to read a few of those here today. Um, <laughs> so they're, they're actually really, it's, it's amazing. There are a lot of themes here in these stories. And, and so one is from um, Edwin Brown, who um, he said his relationship with Dr. Tennyson began nearly 20 years ago in the fall of 1998. So some of you. Some of you may remember it. I was not here then. Uh, I was recently discharged from the Navy and was looking into an engineering program, and Dr. Tennyson happened to be the one professor I found with an open door on that fall day. He took the time to discuss the mechanical engineering program at Boise State and set me on a course that would forever change my life. He was very instrumental in molding me into the engineer I am today. From being a student of his to working for him, I have nothing but fond memories during my time at BSU. Whenever I deal with prototype models in my work for, for new equipment and problem solving, I always reflect on my experiences with Dr. Jones. So that was uh, you know, 20 years ago. And he called you today, I think, is that right? So now yeah, we're going to switch gears a little bit. There's another one that's maybe, I think he graduated about maybe six or seven years ago, Dustin Deacons. Some of you may remember him. Um, I'm going to just read one of his, and since uh, this one has a little bit of foul language, so I'm going to say if you don't like it, you can talk to the chair of the department and let you know. <laughs> so, number one, he, he takes no bullshit from students and distractions. He would just stop lecturing and just stand there with his glare <laughs> until the distraction stopped. <laughs> it was fantastic and very embarrassing for the student that was being distracted. Um, I enjoyed the show on multiple games. <laughs> so that's just a warning to all of you. <laughs> you know, keep, keep focused on what's happening today. So, so that was Dustin. And, and lastly, I have, I have several of these, but these are the ones that I picked out. Uh, this one is from Yvette Barrios. And uh, she's probably, I think she probably graduated in 2001. Yvette? She's actually what? Oh, three. Right, wait, oh, three. Okay. So Yvette says, there were multiple times I wanted to quit engineering. I didn't feel I was smart enough, good enough. Dr. Steve Tennyson was a great mentor and pushed me to keep going. He provided an opportunity with an NSF grant and the opportunity to work with him in the lab. Without this opportunity, I'm not sure where I would be today. Thank you, Dr. Tennyson. I appreciate the support. And it's unfortunately, students tomorrow will miss your guidance and, and mentorship. Let's eat that. So, I, uh, sorry about that, it's kind of, it makes me a little bit sad too. Or not sad, but it makes me emotion. Um, it's really, there's a lot of great stories. I'll share these with, with, with Steve as well. Some of you are here today that, that share. Um, but without further ado, I want to also let people know, as part of this introduction, that we have submitted for uh, Dr. Tennyson's emeritus professor status. And I heard just this morning that it has been officially approved. So, without further ado,
Well, as the slide says, uh, this presentation is about uh, my attempts to convert uh, traditional lecture-based uh, course uh, to a so-called flipped classroom active learning and my efforts in, in this uh, behalf. Uh, machine design, very briefly, uh, has two prerequisites, uh, statics and mechanics materials. In the statics course, the students learn how to uh, determine the internal forces acting on a machine part or structural component based on the external loads imposed on it. And then they go ahead with mechanics and materials and learn how to uh, incorporate the geometric properties of the cross section of the part to determine the state of stress. Then they come into machine design and they learn how to compare the state of stress to the strength of the material uh, and apply a failure theory to determine whether the part can withstand the static loads or endure the cyclic loads imposed upon it. So that's where we are uh, with machine design. One, and what the students are attempting to do. So here's two flow charts. Uh, the top one reflects the uh, traditional lecture-based uh, approach, which I was raised up in. Uh, the students come to class uh, without any pre-notion of what the lecture is about, and the student, uh, the instructor pres presents the topics, uh, the theory, and the application. Uh, the, <coughs> the students uh, try to pay attention, listen attentively, uh, take notes, perhaps ask them questions. Then after class is over, uh, they're faced with the homework assignment and perhaps then realize, uh, gosh, I didn't get everything in class that I thought I did. Uh, I've got some questions. So I spent quite a bit of time going back and forth uh, between lecture notes and textbooks and examples, uh, the work of problem sets, uh, analytic problems, sort of making, using lots of math, theory, making calculations. Uh, so then what I'll focus on is the bottom flow chart where, uh, well, well, we'll call this the tennis version of a flipped classroom. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different uh, varieties, and this is the one that uh, I tried out. Uh, basically, the student is expected to study materials ahead of time and then take a quiz off board of class before they come to class. And then in class, uh, the traditional lecture format is minimized and team-based active learning is um, accentuated. And then afterwards, uh, in concept anyway, uh, the students are better prepared to work on their assignments and things are more streamlined. Also, as part of this presentation, you're going to get the students' response to what I was attempting to do. So, here we are, uh, the students study posted materials ahead of class. And what I did uh, on a university website uh, posted my notes. Uh, so, for instance, before one of the class, the students know ahead of time what sections uh, of my notes they're supposed to review uh, for the quiz. And then they had my notes. So, for instance, when they read the first two paragraphs of my notes about fatigue, uh, failure, uh, after those two paragraphs, after the first couple of paragraphs, they should have understood the definition of fatigue failure, which uh, is basically parts failing by a fracture under repeated loading. And so here's, here was the first question I posed on the survey. Uh, how useful are the blackboard posted lecture materials in your preparation for pre-class quizzes? Uh, and most of the students thought that uh, they were partially adequate, that they did need to go to the textbook, and that was fine. I, I did try to set it up so that maybe 80% 80, 80 of the uh, what they needed for the, the quiz was uh, on, in my notes. They would have to refer to the textbook too. So then, then after studying the notes, then they would take a pre-class quiz uh, at one of the university computers or their own uh, laptop. 
the, the, the quizzes were set up so they became available about a day and a half before class and up to about an hour and, hour and a half before class. Uh, they were timed, and once they started, they had to keep going, and they couldn't backtrack to <coughs> bug some of the students because they realized when they got to question seven that they should have answered the question two differently. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they, they knew when the quiz became available and when it became unavailable and the time they had. Uh, the reason it became unavailable was I wanted to get get through the quiz before class started, and about a <clears throat> half hour before class started, they could see the results of the quiz. Uh, so how much effort or time are you able to devote to preparing pre-class quizzes? Uh, about 10% always had time, uh, Some found some time for it, and I could tell uh, a lot of students said, boy, I'll just take this quiz cold if you want to. <laughs> uh, uh, not not the fun our students, but our our, our our spring semester junior year is uh, really they're 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 really heavily voted up, uh, and every moment is precious for them in class and out of class. So not unsurprisingly, they didn't have a lot of time uh, there. So were were the pre-class quizzes any good? And getting, did the students feel that the pre, taking the pre-class quiz was any good in preparing them for class? Um, so most of them thought it had some utility, some some benefit in getting ready for class. Uh, about fifty percent of them said, "What what is the connection anyway?" <laughs> <laughs> okay, right here. Uh, so the students come into the class with some preparation for class, some state of knowledge, and elementary. So you're, you are sitting in the classroom that, where the course was given, and this class, this room layout was never intended for uh, flipped classroom teamwork uh, it was presented, uh, set up as a traditional lecture hall. So how in the world uh, do you set it up uh, as for team-based learning? and have the instructor and the learning assistant be able to circulate among the teams to uh, provide some sort of assistance. So I had about 60 students in the class and divided them into three member teams, which is about team-based learning, usually three or four students on a team. So you're looking at the room layout and here I am at the front of the room, and you folks are sitting back, sitting back here. So what I figured was uh, it would be easy to get to the teams in the first row, but after that, uh, how do you get between uh, rows? So we left the second row un unoccupied, the fourth row unoccupied, and that way we could get to the teams on the third row and the fourth row. And right in the back here, we had one team on each end. Uh, would it also avail itself to uh, what we're trying to do. So here is the classroom in class, and here's my able assistant, Juan Kuhn, uh, working with <coughs> the team on the fourth row. Again, three member teams. Uh, here I am uh, hassling the team. <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't he go away? <laughs> <laughs> so then, so then, the students get get into class and take their positions. And then, what what do I do? Um, so I would either review, or, I'm sorry, review the quiz, or if the students have done really well on the quiz, uh, they can go right into mini lecture, or uh, maybe incorporate some of the answers quiz in the mini lecture and then take some time to introduce the exercise that they would be working on during class. Okay, so now just a brief bit of uh, what this was like. So today we're going to get into uh, chapter six. Uh, this is a uh, 
drive shaft will have a constant moment uh, through this section right here. Is the moment created because it's rotating or is it just because it's rotating? Well, it's those are two separate things. So the horizontal axis to a log scale is the number of cycles to failure. So these, these equations there, and we'll be using these equations uh, today. In our so here's what we're going, here's what we're going to work on. We're, we're going to emulate a RR more bending stress test without running the test but using the equations derived from that, the empirical equations derived from that stress test. And each team is going to calculate an N for, for a particular completely reverse bending stress. You know what your team number is. So for instance, teams one and two are going to calculate the uh, cycles of life associated with a uh, fatigue strength of 60 kPSO, and team three and four, 60 kPSO. So today, you're going to work with your own team, and then you're also going to work between teams. So if you have a team close by uh, making the same set of calculations, and I would suggest uh, perhaps that the team leaders uh, sit close to one another. is the preparatory overview given before starting the classroom exercise. Uh, about half the students thought they were ready to go on the exercise. A lot of the students felt they needed some further instructions. I guess that's all right. The, uh, one of the big challenges in solving an engineering problem is, guys, just what is it anyway we're supposed to be doing? And uh, are we given enough information to get going here? And, and really uh, having some questions about what to do that uh, gives Juan Kuhn and myself a chance to start interacting with the students. And here just very briefly uh, 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 a portion of the top sheet of an exercise. Notice that there's a team leader, a team recorder, and a team monitor. Uh, they all had specific um, responsibilities and they were pretty good at uh, changing roles uh, from one uh, class to the next. Uh, the team recorder uh, was responsible for writing up the solution to the team. So each team turned in just one effort. And for, so for instance, uh, sometimes I was able to uh, give different teams different input parameters which have, would affect their solutions. And then at the end of the class, we compare how varying the input parameter uh, affected the output. So here, for instance, teams one and two uh, had a cyclic stress of 60,000 PSI, and would calculate the cycles of life for that part, and they would expect to have uh, somewhat higher life than with a higher stress. So we, we talked about that uh, at the end of the class period. Hopefully, if I designed it so we had time to do that. So now the, the students are ready to start their exercise and work uh, as a team interactively with Juan Kuhn and I uh, as they need to in uh, working through the problem. So uh, here, thanks to Justin's effort, we're, we're going to get to see uh, them working on this and I'll get this started here. <coughs>
big lady in North Carolina uh, teacher with a student who asked me a question in a pre lecture and noticed she was still sitting there working on a problem, wondering how to work the problem based on my answer for her question. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the student in, one of the students in the baseball cap there raises baseball cap, uh, Josh Newberg, uh, who was just informed on Tuesday that his uh, wrestling team had been disbanded. So he, he was one of my students that made the front page of the newspaper on Wednesday. Okay, so. Um, how effective is the teamwork approach for you in solving the multi-step problems? Um, so about 80% of the students thought there was some benefit in uh, working uh, together in class this way. So how effective is the assistance provided your team in working through the exercise? And then that reflected back on what I'm doing and myself. Uh, most of the students seem to think they were getting some help up. <coughs> we really uh, could have used another learning assistant or two, and no complaint about that. Um, we, we could have just used more uh, learning assistants in the classroom. I think that would have helped. So um, I did set up. I, I set up the same group uh, grading rubric for the uh, for the students on the in-class exercise that I use for homework and test, hopefully getting them lined up so uh, minimize the points off that they would lose on homework and tests um, to get that student out on the in-class exercise. And I did count 5% uh, of the grade uh, did, was based on these their efforts on the in-class exercise. Uh, here we can see what I consider a very thorough and detailed uh, grading of one team's efforts. Uh, they actually did pretty good. They put some things they did incorrectly and left out. Uh, so I call this a thorough grading. Uh, one of the students informed me on the survey that he considered this brutal grading. <laughs> <laughs> The instructor in the uh, student can have very different uh, perspectives on grade of work. <laughs> <laughs> so is there any benefit to having detailed grading of the in-class solved exercises? As I said, uh, so I had 19 exercises to grade uh, from one class to the next. And uh, nicely enough, about half the students thought this was helpful to them. Uh, and about 40% of them thought it was somewhat questionable because uh, their efforts were sort of integrated into one solution. Um, and perhaps, well, uh, one of my uh, peers, uh, Lisa Barney Smith, uh, has her, her students, each team, each member on each team turns in a solution, and the team is responsible to make sure that every student on that team has completed the solution. So that, that would be one way to uh, alleviate the 40 percent that you said to me. So now the students have uh, been to class, they've turned in their work, and they're ready to uh, start the homework. So here, uh, on this highly prejudiced uh, flowchart, we see the, the four students in the traditional classroom spending a lot of time outside of class. And my students, after a brief review, are to solve their homework, no problem. So, well, let's see what they think about it. So, just to kind of make it clear here, these students are solving uh, what I consider challenging, difficult problems, uh, very complex, complicated, uh, with many steps. And that's one of the challenges that uh, I think we face in, in, in engineering is uh, <coughs> There's lots of steps to solving these problems, and the students have to un understand the process that they go through to solve the problems. It's not a bunch of uh, disparate steps. So, how effective is an in-class team-based uh, how effective is in-class team-based problem-solving approach in preparing you to work through subsequent homework? 
and two um, percent thought they were ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> so thirteen percent said, uh, "What? What's the connection anyway?" Uh, <laughs> and then the, the, the bulk of the students, about 80%, uh, thought they some study or uh, significant study, and uh, which I think is to be expected. And this this question I, I realized is um, kind of a com I think there's really three factors here. Uh, there's the teamwork, and there's the exercise itself, and there's a the preparation before class and the instructors lecture during class that they're, they're all involved here. So there's this, uh, the response to this question I think is rich with implications as to what could be adjusted to perhaps, uh, well, uh, one other aspect of uh, educational uh, assistance that was introduced in the course was the idea of the learning assistant uh, providing off-board uh, assistance to work out the problems assignments and that fell on Juan Kuhn. Uh, and he, he had sessions three times a week for one hour and also assisted the students in reviewing the test. So based on this data, we saw that uh, at least, well, 70% of the students in the class uh, attended at least once. Uh, I saw that 30% attended at least three times, 18% attended at least six times. So there, there was a small core of students who regularly uh, attended one uh, sessions. So here, uh, here we'll have a chance to say uh, Five students like Juan Kuhn over the last uh, 30, 35 years. Uh, when he writes a solution, uh, it's impeccable. Uh, it's like his writing is almost like typing. Uh, just, just incredible. And everyone uh, in our department watches him as a learning assistant, as a graduate student, and everything else. So I, I was very fortunate. So these uh, percentages here uh, reflect a, a previous slide. And one thing we might think about uh, constructively is, well, how, how can we enhance the uh, uh, participation in these uh, learning, <coughs> learning assistance sessions? And should the instructor uh, get himself over there once in a while, too? It's a long way away, Steve. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Some of us are sort of old and tired. <laughs> so how effective uh, 
so they had, had, had a good response here. Most of the students thought they got, got a lot of, got out of working with them. Okay, so now we get sort of the wind up here. Um, what, what were their overall, what were the students' overall impressions of, uh, of this flipped classroom approach? Um, so some of them thought, a few of them thought, okay, it's great the way it is. Uh, most of the students thought that we needed some tune-up or some, uh, listen, no, this, this one's, how, what is your overall impression of this particular activity classroom? Um, so the approach has merit. I can relate to the activities. Typical, typically, I'm learning. Uh, that was about 40%. Uh, some of them thought it was so unconventional that they're only occasionally learning. Uh, some of them, quite a few of them, thought it was just sort of a fad. Uh, but I, I think you can see uh, from uh, Justin's highly biased uh, editing of the in-class exercise what they're doing. Uh, they seem to be having a pretty good time. So what suggestions do you have for future versions of the course? Okay. So well, yeah, well, most of them thought, pretty much thought that uh, something could be done with it. Uh, maybe quite a bit could be done. So then uh, question 13, uh, they actually uh, made uh, the comments. And uh, briefly, they were uh, students thought that it should be more of a tradition, more of a traditional lecture complex. Uh, either have one day a week for lecturing and, that, and another day for the in-class, or some of both, both days. Uh, some students thought there needed to be a better connection made between the pre-class studying and what we did in class. Uh, other students thought there needed to be a better connection between the in-class work and the out-of-class work homework assignments. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, room, room for uh, adjustment and improvement. And I basically took the course to be like a first, a first uh, a design, a, a first prototype testing of the design. And what engineers love to do then is take the prototype, the first prototype, and uh, improve on that. Uh, I also had uh, five of my peers come and observe the course and give their impressions and critique. Uh, Elisa and Krishna here from the College of Engineering, uh, from the Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, Matt Schmess, Mao, and Shika Bose, and Brittany Earl uh, came over. Um, uh, Devshika uh, spent a lot of time one summer very patiently uh, trying to teach an old dog some new tricks. I really appreciate her efforts. Uh, Brittany Earl, uh, also from the Center of Teaching and Learning. And here, here was their uh, comments. Uh, Elisa uses short in class videos, and uh, Devshika is. Uh, very high on that too. Uh, Krishna, uh, things, thank you. very helpful suggestions like uh, try to avoid distractions like handing back homework uh, during the class. It tends to distract the students from what you're doing. Uh, one, once you get, once you turn students loose and they start working on their teams and trying to get their attention back, uh, it's rather challenging. Uh, so Brittany has down the earth suggestion: uh, just bring a class. To Bring it, bell the class and ring it. <laughs> and uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Inich uh, uh indicated that not everyone in the edu educational community is totally sold on this flip classroom approach. Uh, the first two papers, the first two studies, uh, and as I said, look. If you want to make this class, if you want to make this flipped classroom stuff work, uh, you'd better invest some effort in the instructorship. And I think we really are working on this uh, here at the University. <coughs> our, uh, Center for our Center for Teaching and Learning uh, is 
a very big thing here on campus. I've taken taken some advantage of it, uh, probably not all that I could by any means. And the the, the people over there, like uh, Matt and Brittany and Devshika, are just uh, very valuable uh, to what they can offer. Uh, the other paper here, uh, Kirshner and Sloan and Clark, uh, seem to specialize in knocking this stuff. Uh, they had it. They, in a particular paper, they were talking about minimal guidance during instruction does not work. Uh, that's probably true. I, I wouldn't consider what I'm doing minimal instruction. It's not really a discovery process. If anything, I'd probably uh, have too much guidance. So, then wind it up here. Uh, my own personal observations in comparing what I was trying to do, uh, endeavoring to do, compared to a traditional approach. Uh, I think the opportunities for interaction with students uh, is much greater than with the traditional approach. Uh, you get a, a classroom loaded up like we have here today, and there will only be one or two really extroverted students uh, who will ever ask questions during class. The rest of the students uh, stay with fast and refuse. Now, and the other thing, so opportunities for interaction greatly increase. The opportunity to address students' questions and misconceptions, misconceptions and errors during the class uh, is, is greatly enhanced. Um, and usually, what I share over here is spend a minute or two with a student and you usually get things straightened out um, rather quickly. Uh, I think opportunities for innovation for in opportunities for innovation in teaching and learning uh, is, is greatly enhanced over the traditional approach. Uh, what they're doing, it, what they're trying to do with us at the Center for Teaching and Learning for new people and trying to entice the more seasoned instructors uh, to do, uh, there's just so many different kinds of things that can be done, I think, over a traditional approach. And certainly it's, it's really great to be able to interact with peers like uh, Elisa and Krishna uh, you, you have some, you can, you can talk shop. So, um, just from what the students said on their responses, and uh, my peer evaluators um, talked about uh, these are places where if I did and would have the opportunity, uh, what I think I could do for, for a course like this to. Uh, they could better accommodate uh, students' interests and in, in needs. So I think that's, that's all I've got to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> basically one of the last semesters before your retirement here you're, you're flipping the classroom and taking a whole other approach so I, I think that really deserves another round of applause <laughs> so we have some time for questions on this this topic oh, yeah my question is uh, how did you go about implementing this for the first time the first semester and what challenges did you face in trying to Okay, the question is about uh, preparation of flip and how did I go about it. Uh, I did spend quite a time at the Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, listening and learning from, from the experts on educational uh, technology and so forth. Uh, that, that was helpful, so I had, had some guidelines. Uh, I did find it, it, it took me it took me a long time. Uh, know that Yoshika wanted me to go to uh, videos and uh, which is fine. I, I would like to do that. It just took me a long time to get, to get my course notes uh, professionalized uh, and, and standalone for the students. So I think the, the big challenge for me was, was putting things in place and getting things ready to go. Um, I hope that addressed Yeah, it does to some extent. Uh, 
So I have two questions. You've been teaching this class for like 52 years, right? 32. <laughs> Question number one is what's your sense of how well they learned the material compared to the other way of teaching? And two, which was more fun for you? Not the students. So that how can you can you get a sense? Can you have um, 82 years of experience? <laughs> can, you, can, you get, can you get a sense of like, how how well they learned it over you know compared to the traditional? And how much fun did you have compared to the traditional? Well, the the, uh, the, the first question uh, uh, comparing uh, the results student learning traditional compared to the flip. Um, this this is really uh, a good question for educational research. I think it's still uh, still up in the air. Um, one, one, I guess the, the plus side is I didn't have the students didn't revolt. Uh, they didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have what they didn't have what students in the honor. They didn't have what the students in the office and playing. <laughs> Not that we told you about. Not that we told you about. Oh, you haven't given them a final yet. I was going to say, do you know? I'm just based on their exams. Well, I, I could give them a final where everybody excelled and we decided to give them a great final. No, I think it's the same final you gave 82 years ago. How would they do? <laughs> Question number two. Yeah. You Situations, kind of class you can think of where this would not be a good method of instruction? Or uh, the question is uh, are there courses or classes for which the flipped classroom approach would, would not be adequate? I don't know that I have a good response to that. That's an excellent question. Uh,
on a team uh, with two guys. Uh, in this class, I had three two women teams, and uh, Louise from North Carolina had to sit with two guys. But at least you got to sit in the middle of the room. Uh, <laughs> the other students were just by, by default, uh, and that's uh, Elisa changes, uh, reorganizes her teams every week. And the students seem to accommodate that. Uh, Megan Ferry, uh, who teaches the version of the course in material science and engineering, uh, queries her students as to whether they would like to uh, switch teams or not and leaves it up to them. And she indicates that most of the time, you know, once the students get set, they, they stay set. Um, <coughs> my impression was each of the teams, the members seem to be, to be able to get along and work constructively together. I didn't notice any, any dissension on any team. So I, I just left it the way it was. So this is they were sitting around? Well, basically the teams, it was, it was three member teams, okay? And, and, and they sat together. Um, well, oh, this, uh, the, I, my education was in open classrooms, and it seemed like there was a big difference in the teams that you worked with, and um, how an instructor went about helping you create those teams or not. And so I think that can make a big difference. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yes. C certainly, how you organize teams. And also, uh, the teams are given no instruction on how to get together and work together constructively. And I think that uh, that's a place for uh, the instructor on the flip class <coughs> should and needs to take that into account. Well, the, the best I was ever in was the instructor had um, everybody line up and they said, he said, so who you know, which students like to get things done ahead of time, and you know, they um, always want to have, you know, their work ready and done on time, and, and you step forward. Who are the students that are more relaxed about it, and don't want, you know, don't want to be on a team that, that is that uptight? You step backwards. <laughs> and then they would, they'd ask a whole bunch of questions about your style of learning and working, and then you step to the side if it was one way, or a side, and then you step forward again, and pretty soon you'd end up with a small group. And that, when I had that, that was the best group I ever worked with. And when I taught as well, and had people work in teams, I had them do that same thing. And I had a lot of comments about that was the best team I ever worked with. So you were working with a group of people that had a similar learning style, and liked to work in the same way that you liked to work, and it seemed like a big difference. So I just wondered, you know, perhaps you know, another experiment that made. Oh, great. Make a difference. Yeah, great, great input. And um, we're, was this only in the classroom, or, or was this also one outside of the classroom? Okay, as well. okay, good, good point. And this is something I need to point out. The teamwork approach, the organized teamwork approach, was just in class. Outside of class, the students were on their own. Some, some, uh, some professors. There's a uh, professors um, in uh, chemical engineering, at one of the southern universities, insists that the students have to teamwork solutions outside of class too. And their teamwork makes a <coughs> makes a great difference. Yeah, for sure. But your what you're saying about in class work uh, I think would, would uh, fit well too. Uh, for perhaps the students could, could work there. So again, the, the idea, you know, that this flipped classroom approach to active learning I think has so many more interesting dimensions over and above the traditional approach of the kinds of things that we've done. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Stenson, first off, should be commended for changing up your entire routine. It's a, it's a big deal, which you did the past semester. Um, this being my second degree, when I went to Cal Poly, a lot of the classes were lectured. How to get done, how, what did we learn, what just happened, go back in the book, the notes, trying to figure out the homework. I've been fortunate to have two active learning classes at Boise State, one in math, the other in chemistry. and. Just by doing that, because a professor can lecture, say this is how we use a particular equation to solve a problem, but it's really when you end up diving into it during class with the uh, guidance of your professor or learning assistants, you figure out the, uh, the, the quirks with the equation, you figure out how your wiring works, how your brain works, re remembering and going through the process. 
Um, and what was neat with my chemistry class, at least for me, because it was active learning all the way through, when I got to the test, I didn't have to review as long as I did with other classes where it's lecture only, because I've been doing the entire process through uh, the entire class. Uh, but my only comment is, as far as learning assistance, I, I say all that because we've got quite a distinguished crowd here of professors, and I hope that they take into consideration your lesson plan that you did, because this is fantastic. Um, but I do suggest, as far as learning assistance, because I had that trouble in math, and in chemistry, we had a ratio of learning assistance to students about 10. One assistant to 10 students. And I find that if you have more learning assistance in classes like these, that it would be more helpful for the guidance and learning. So thank you very much for what you've done. Well, I, I appreciate your comments. And, uh, yeah. what, um, one thing that happens was I, I had, and I read, and uh, I know Brittany Girl also pointed this out. You need to spend some time selling this concept to your students. Well, what is it you're trying to accomplish and how you're going about it and why it's beneficial? And I had planned on doing that the first day of practice this semester and we had a snow day. <laughs> <laughs> kind of behind the whole rest of the course. <laughs> uh, you, you assigned roles to each team that were team leader and reporter. Could you elaborate a little bit on what the roles were? Yes, um, the, 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 the team leader had the responsibility to make sure that everything got done that was given on the assignment, that it was done according to the specifications. Um, the, the quarter was responsible for getting everything down uh, that was done. And the monitor uh, also helped the recorder out uh, with, with the solution and, and, and keeping things organized. And the leader kept going. The leader was supposed to keep track of time and, and how much you know, how much time we had left. So, uh, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't bring that slide, but I, I can certainly uh, provide that information to you. And that the, the team leader, recorder, and monitor. Um, <coughs> I picked that up from one of the papers that was uh, provided at the Center for Teaching and Learning. So did you flip those roles from time to time? Yes, the, the, the question is, uh, did the team roles change from time to time? And I did ask the students to change to change roles for every time. And I, I think they were I think they're pretty good about doing that. They they, they did switch. I, I tried to have uh, the recorder sit in the middle of the team so that both the monitor and the leader could uh, have the people in the You discussed the team-based class activities. Do you, do you see any value to having uh, individual class activities? Uh, yes, and I think there, there are variants on that. Like I say, uh, uh, Elisa, uh, has the students, each student creates an individual, each student on each team creates an individual solution. And the three team members work together to make sure that everybody gets a solution uh, before the class, before any of them turn to work. Uh, I have, actually, I've used in classes in, in my traditional approach, um, and it's, 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 it's kind of tricky. If, if you take the students through step by step, and every step, Make sure that the student has a, has a, a step solved at that point. Uh, the real conscientious students uh, will will get in, and by gosh, they'll they'll try and get every step solved before you give the solution. Uh, other steps, other students probably like I would have uh, would, would sit there and wait. <laughs> you know, and, and, and finally, I showed this, that part of the solution on the board, and then I scribble it down. And it down and back. So, how, how do you go through this? But, but certainly you don't want the students to get completely bogged down and stop. So uh, I, think, I think there's an art in that. Uh, they, so your, your question was, yes, that there is merit in having the students go through individually. And I think that they would have appreciated that uh, in, in this course a lot of them. And again, it has to do with how much time you have outside of class to 
the large class and actually go through the grading students will be One more, and then I want to. I got an announcement. So, All right. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate your input on the, the lecture, and it sounds like it was a good experiment overall. My question is, if you were still teaching over the next two semesters, let's say, what would you would you still use this active learning classroom, this flipped classroom? And if so, <laughs> what would you change about it? Uh, good, good question, and I uh, I tried to address that with with this last slide here. The, the, the things that yes, I. I would be enthusiastic about um, doing this again, and I think the response for the students was positive enough, and the students adapted to themselves enough that it would certainly be worth uh, taking everything, all their critiques into account, and change things around to, to get even a better response from the students. Very good. All righty. Well. Um, at this point, I'm going to let's go ahead and call it a uh, cut this portion uh, short here, and I'm sure there will be other questions. We do have a reception uh, immediately after this event uh, out at the um, in the, by the fountain. There's going to be some tables set up there, so we will be out there. Uh, everybody can reconvene out there and I'll have an opportunity to talk with uh, with Dr. Tennyson at that point. But I do want to take this uh, time now to present uh, Dr. Steve Tennyson with a plaque that is uh, commemorating his time here at Boise State as a founding faculty and professor of mechanical engineering from 1995 to 2017. So I want to thank you so much. Transition outside and enjoy some wonderful day and some snacks.